we have this uh, Zoom meeting of those that uh, will participate in this class tonight. We're in the study of uh, Galatians, and uh, we left off at the uh, fifth verse of chapter three last week, so that's where we'll start tonight. But before we do, though, let's have a uh, short word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this <clears throat> time of study, for the things that we can learn to better prepare ourselves for use in our Master's kingdom. We pray that they'll bless the word wherever it is preached and taught, that it may have its full effect, that it may not come back void. And from, we're mindful of the uh, brethren who are suffering. And we're mindful of what Paul said about rejoicing with those that rejoice and weeping those that weep. And we're thankful that we can uh, be of such a uh, have such concern about our brothers and sisters in Christ that we can do that, especially our little case, and we're mindful of him and his condition and pray in our providential care that that would restore him to a good measure of health. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so we start in verse uh, five. <clears throat> And there it reads, therefore, he who supplies a spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? <clears throat> so we, we sort of know from this that, you know, the Galatians could work miracles. At Ephesus, Paul supplied the, uh, the spirit to the 12 or so disciples there, Acts 19. Uh, one verse uh, one through sixteen. By he laid the hands on them. That's how they received the mir miracle. So it's plausible that Paul also supplied spiritual gifts to the Galatians as well, whether they were using them well or not. Don't know. But he asked a uh, rhetorical question: Was it by the works of the law or by the the faith once delivered to the saints that they uh, were able to work these miracles? And the answer, of course, is uh, certainly by the hearing of faith. <clears throat> that being the case, uh, question not asked or, uh, you know, uh, presumed here is why then would the Galatians want to give that up? So they couldn't have both. They couldn't have the works of the law and the, or what the Spirit supplies. It, they just weren't compatible. It couldn't be, couldn't be done. So why, why do they want to go back? The old law. In verse six, he says, "Just as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness." Now, this is a quote from Genesis, the fifteenth chapter, verse six. Speaking of Abraham, he believed in the Lord, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. <clears throat> so Paul is making the argument that it was the uh, faith of Abraham that justified him, not the works of the old law. Of course, by that at that time, the law of Moses had not been given yet. So the obedience of Abraham was accepted because it was done in faith, not because of the law under which he uh, operated. Like I say, Abraham lived before the law of Moses, so he couldn't appeal to the what uh, I am referring to as the old law. He couldn't appeal to that. No service under the law, any law, uh, was accepted unless faith was the motivation. So a pure law system uh, just didn't work. There had to be a faith associated with it. So Abraham had no righteousness of his own. Abraham's faith was confirmed by acts of obedience, and just as it is today. So, uh, consequently, these were acts of righteousness, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. <clears throat> As it is said in uh, Romans, the fourth chapter, verse 11, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while still uncircumcised, talking about Abraham, that he might be the father of all those who believe, 
though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness may be imputed to them also. So the, again, the question is, why do the Galatians want to go back to under a system that uh, would not, uh, and under which they could not be righteous? <clears throat> In verse 7, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Gene genealogical descent is not the criterion of sonship of Abraham, but spiritual sonship is produced out of faith. By faith, Abraham believed God's promises and acted upon those promises. And although circumcision, circumcision had not been mentioned, that was the theme of the uh, Judaizers, at least at this time it had been mentioned, but it will be. <clears throat> Paul makes it clear in Romans, the second chapter, verses 28 and 29, that is, it is the circumcision of the heart that makes one a Jew and thereby a true son of Abraham. It reads there, for he, was, he is not a Jew, he is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly in circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter. Whose praise is not from men, but from God. <clears throat> in verse eight, it reads uh, in the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed. And the scripture is the inspired word of God, and uh, therefore, once it's spoken, it settles, settles the matter in all things spiritual. The gospel was good news. That's what it means, good news. And the good news preached to Abraham was that in you, all the nations shall be blessed. Of course, this meant that the Gentiles would be just by, just by the faith as Abraham had been. These men of faith of all ages are the true sons of Abraham. Of course, this was accomplished to the Savior, as it says in verse 26. We are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> verse 9, it says, so then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. If we believe as Abraham did, whether Jew or Gentile, we will be blessed as was Abraham. Verse 10, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So those whose confidence was in the works of the law who only depended on them, were not freed from sin. How much more so when they did so after the law was taken out of the way by the cross of Christ, Colossians 2, 14. <clears throat> no one other than Christ could keep the law perfectly. So therefore the law, and we're talking about the old law, or any law for that matter, the law could only condemn. They went under the curse of the law because of that feature of law. In verse 11, it says, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. <clears throat> no one can be justified without faith and the obedience to which that faith leads. The old law was a pure law system one could be justified by the old law only if it was kept perfectly. Otherwise, all it could do was condemn. And it was evident that no one other than Christ, of course, kept it perfectly. <clears throat> so it only condemned. Therefore, it was necessary to replace the old law with a faith system under which the penitent sinner could be justified. <clears throat> In uh, Galatians 3.12, it says, yet the law was not a faith, 
but the man who does them shall live by them. And that's a quote from uh, Leviticus, the 18th chapter, verse 5. It says, There you shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. And also we read that in Romans, the 10th chapter, verse 5, where Moses writes about the righteousness, which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. <clears throat> the law gives life for doing and not believing. Saving faith in God leads one to obey the things commanded by God. Paul is not arguing that saving faith and the observance of ordinances is a matter of habit, as a matter of habit, are incompatible in practice. But if combined as a basis of justification, then the combination is condemned. Paul argues that salvation by law is impossible, for no man obeys the commandments of the law perfectly. Men of the law bargain with God, whereas men of faith commit themselves to trust in God. In verse 13, it, it reads, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. <clears throat> the curse of the law is not the curse of God. And, uh, you know, go back and look at verse 10. It is the nature of law. All under the law are under condemnation of the law for violating it until Christ came and suffered and took away their sins. Anyone who was crucified was cursed. So Christ became cursed on our behalf so we would not have to be condemned as he was. In Galatians, the third chapter, verse uh, 14, it reads there that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in this continuation of uh, verse uh, 13, having become a curse for us, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. <clears throat> you might want to look in, again at the uh, prophecy of Joel uh, quoted under verse Two, so Christ was the seed of Abraham through whom Jew, Jews and Gentiles would be blessed. In verse 15, it reads, Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant. Yet, if it is confirmed, no one knows or adds to it. In uh, commercial law, our uh, the law of descent, you know, wheels and stuff. Uh, first law concerning contracts and laws of succession, wheels again. Once executed, it is not annulled nor changed except through a mutual annulment or amendment. So we know that uh, whatever the events are specified in the contract, once those come to fruition, can't be changed. The consequences can be, but that clause can be changed. Or after a will is uh, executed, once the person dies, then you can't change the will. Verse 16 says, now to Abraham and his seed where the promise is made. It does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. It was through the seed, singular, of Abraham, that is Christ, that all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And you can read uh, that in Genesis, the 22nd chapter, verse 18, where it talks about the seed and Abraham being blessed. In uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 17, in this I say that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul a covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ that it should make the promise of no effect. <clears throat> the promise of the blessing was first given in Genesis 12, chapter verse 3, uh, when uh, 
Abraham was commanded to leave Ur of the Chaldees and, and Haran. The law of Moses followed uh, 430 years later. And it could not annul the promise given and confirmed by God to Abraham. The promise stood firm and was fulfilled by Christ. In verse 18 of Galatians third chapter, for if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer promised, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. If the inheritance given to all nations and the promise to Abraham came through the law of Moses 430 years subsequent to the promise, then the promise was of none effect, didn't mean anything. The fulfillment of the promise is unaffected by the law. It is not dependent on the law or on some combination of the promise and the law. <clears throat> the promise stands alone. Verse 19, it says, what purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions until the, until the seed should come to whom the, promises, uh, the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels. And we, uh, we'll read that below. It's, it's specified or talked about in Acts the seventh chapter, verse 53, where it says, we have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. In Hebrews 2, uh, verse 2, for the word spoken through the angels proved steadfast, so forth. So it was uh, spoken or pointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. In this case, it was uh, Moses. <clears throat> the natural question that uh, may have arisen in the mind of the Galatians, and maybe us too, is what purpose then did the law serve if the promise is independent of the law? It was added because the children of Israel transgressed the will of God in sin. That is, it was a temporary measure or expedient, if you will, to cope with sin. It was supplementary and subordinate to the covenant with Abraham. Therefore, it was provisional until the promise was fulfilled in Christ. In verse 20, Galatians 3:20, it says, Now a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. And the promise was made to Abraham directly uh, by God, and he, he didn't at that time use a mediator, and it was not through a, a mediator, but the law was given through a mediator, namely uh, Moses, who acted as such between God and man. So there's a difference there between those two. In Galatians, the third chapter, verse 21, is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if that had been a, uh, a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. So does the giving of the law militate against the fulfillment of the promise? No, it doesn't, certainly not. The old law, the law of Moses, was a divine law. It came from God. So if a perfect law system, keep in mind it's a perfect law system, could have been given eternal life, it would have been the mosaical law system. But a pure law system just couldn't deliver. So there had to be something else, and that is the law of Christ, the gospel. <clears throat> In Galatians, the uh, third chapter, verse 22, but the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. The old law condemned the Jew and the patriarchal law condemned the Gentile. The promise was fulfilled by faith in Jesus Christ to those who believe. So that's, uh, you know, of course, it should emphasize this to those who believe, believe and obey the gospel. <clears throat> In the 23rd verse, we read, but before faith came, we were kept under guard. Now, the King James Version does not have under guard. Uh, 
and the ASB has in ward, not inward, but in ward, in the war, in the in the possession of a ward. But the Greek has uh, the word translated, it has shut up. And so it has the idea of being kept under guard or kept, uh, kept in a ward, in ward. So we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith, which would afterward be revealed. So God dealt with Abraham by the law of faith. On account of sins, he dealt with the Jews and Gentiles through the law of works, the old law of Moses and the law of patriarchy. patriarchy. The old law acted as a guard, ward, or tutor. It delivered those under its authority to the faith of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> In Galatians, the third chapter, verse 24, it reads, therefore the law was our tutor. In King James Version has schoolmaster. It was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Tutor or schoolmaster, <clears throat> Uh, it comes from a compound Greek word meaning a leader of children. It has the idea that Jews were in protective custody through the old covenant until the promise was fulfilled. That was uh, this is not to say that there was no instruction under the old law, but in the context of this scripture, schoolmaster, schoolmaster is probably a better wording. Because we get, we get the idea from Tudor that there's they were there to be taught just like a teacher would, but it's more of the notion of a schoolmaster who keeps one there to, until the teacher comes. <clears throat> In the twenty first twenty uh, fifth verse of chapter three, but after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor or schoolmaster, if you will. So after the old law was replaced by the new covenant, there was no need for the protective covenant uh, uh, custody of the old covenant. It just wasn't needed anymore. In the 26th verse, we read, for you are, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Having come to Christ, uh, they are now sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus and not through the works of the law. The all sons here specifies that both Jew and Gentile are included. In Galatians, the 27th verse is for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. This explains how faith made them sons of God. This is a work of faith as opposed to the works of the law. And if we look at the Matthew, the 28th chapter, verses 18 and 19, it says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So it's through uh, baptism as a work of faith that uh, they put on Christ. To put on something is to be identified with whatever it is put on, such as clothes, put on a uh, shoulder pad and pad and helmet, stuff like that, and you're a football player. So whatever you put on, that's what you are. In Colossians, the third chapter of verses eight through 12, but now you yourselves are or to put off all these same kind of uh, same word, anger, wrath, and so forth, and don't lie to one another. Said in verse ten, you have put on same word, uh, the new man who is renewed. In verse eleven, there it says, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all. You know, so when you put on Christ, all these other aspects uh, to your being uh, disappeared. You're now 
uh, one in Christ. So to put on Christ is to become like him in uh, thought, uh, disposition, temperament, character. One who has put on Christ is seen as the very image of Christ, or at least uh, that is as it should be. <clears throat> Obviously, these Christ-like characteristic, uh, characteristics were not acquired suddenly or completely at the moment of baptism, but one must continue to grow and develop uh, spiritually. After all, the baptized person is a new creature, it's not an old creature, but a new creature determined to walk in newness of life. So it becomes a journey. <clears throat> in the 28th uh, verse, uh, it says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave or free, there is neither male or female, for you are all one in wall. Uh, uh, you're all one in Christ Jesus. That's similar to what uh, was uh, we read in, in Colossians 3, verse uh, 11. <clears throat> when people put on Christ, that is, that they are clothed in Christ, one cannot see what is underneath, but only sees the clothing. And that clothing is Christ. The Gentiles, regardless of what the Judaizers said do not have to become Jews to be in Christ. They don't have to be Jews to put on Christ. One can be just a Christian, whether a man or a woman, a freeman or a slave or any ethnicity at all. All in Christ, and Paul declares them to be all, all one in Christ Jesus. All in Christ are equal heirs the promise on equal terms with the natural children of Abraham. Not only that, but all must put on Christ in the same manner as any Christian has done. That's not to imply, of course, that all duties are the same. Uh, in the marriage relationship, for example, men have duties peculiar to husbands and women have duties peculiar to wives. Likewise, men have obligations as men and women have uh, uh, obligations of women that they don't pertain to men. Of course, we seem to have lost that uh, last few years, but it doesn't change it. it, doesn't change the truth of that. Verse 29, if, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. If they, that, that is the Gentiles were in Christ, and of course, they, they maintain that they were in Christ. They were made so by faith and not by works of the old law. If by faith they are Abraham's children, and we can look at the uh, uh, verse, uh, Galatians, third chapter, verse 16 previously, they, you know, they are also declared to be the seed of Abraham. If Abraham's children then, they have union with Christ, wherein is located all spiritual blessings promised to Abraham. In chapter 4, verse 1, Paul writes, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all. So the thought of verse 29 in Revelation 3.29 continues here. And Paul uses a legal analogy to illustrate the condition of the Jews under the old law. A child who is designated as heir of the estate of his father is not able, able to enter into possession of the estate because of his age. He's not of a, a legal age, and uh, what we call today is not of a uh, legal majority. Even if the father is dead, he cannot take position because he does not have the wherewithal to manage the assets. In this respect, he is no different than a slave, although he is the heir of the estate and, and will assume that uh, uh, title eventually. <clears throat> that he is, uh, the, the child is no different from a slave, but is under guardians and stewards 
until the time appointed by the father. Following this analogy, the minor child, though legally entitled to the state, is kept under guardians and stewards that assume, of course, that uh, the father's dead or incapacity for some reason. He's uh, kept under guardians and stewards until the heir reaches majority or the latter time appointed by the father in the will. In some wills, of course, specify that uh, uh, the surviving heir, the child, doesn't necessarily accede to the uh, ownership of the assets or oversight of the assets on reaching age where the majority age is, say 21. They may specify something like he doesn't get the assets and can't dispose of them until he gets to age 35. So the will may specify something other than the time that the uh, child reaches majority. Anyway, the, uh, the old law was a guardian and a steward in, in to the time appointed by the, our heavenly father. In verse three, it says, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Now, this of the elements, you know, it's translated principles in uh, Hebrews 5th chapter verse 12 and, and called beggarly elements in verse 9 uh, below of this chapter. They were under the elements of the world. So before the coming of Christ, both Jew and Gentiles being in the children phase and the law and in which they were amenable were in bondage to that law. The law of Christ has set them both free. The old law which the Judaizers pressed on the Gentiles was an elementary or preparatory school for the gospel. It was a religion of types and shadows of hope and promise that was replaced completely by the law of Christ that is the gospel. <clears throat> In verse four of Galatians, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. <clears throat> so according to the uh, wisdom of God, and that was fixed in his mind from eternity, it was not just something that, you know, all of a sudden came to his mind. It was there, there was a right time in a right way for man's spiritual bondage to the old law to end. The time was now, you know, the time that the gospel was delivered in a way was through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus was sent forth from uh, deity itself because he was deity. <clears throat> in Mark, the first chapter, verse uh, 15, we read, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. And of course, repent and believe in the gospel. In Philippians, the uh, second chapter, verses 5 through 11, you can read that on your own, but it says in verse 7, but he made himself of no reputation, take the form of a bond, bond servant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, in the death of the cross. So there's a right time and the right way for all this to uh, take place. And it was all in the mind of God as to how this would actually come about. <clears throat> in verse five, it says, uh, uh, continuation of verse four, born of a woman, born of the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as son. And you might look at uh, verse 13, previous chapter above. The two purposes of this chapter, uh, verse 5, is one, to redeem those uh, under the law and to, to, to receive adoption. Christ was born under the law so that he could redeem those under the law. He could not die for man's redemption as God. <clears throat> 
God can't die. He had to become man. And keeping the law perfectly without any sin whatsoever, that qualified him to be the Paschal lamb offered for the sins of the people. His sinless life was his qualification, but it was his death on the cross that his redemptive work was accomplished. He was to give his life as a ransom. Um, Mark, uh, Mark 10, verse 45 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. So he's given, he was to give his life a ransom. Jesus died for our sins, not his. First Corinthians 15, verse 3, we read, For I delivered you first of all that which I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, so he died for our sin, not his. His death was uh, necessary to redeem the Jews from the law. Therefore, the Gentiles must not let themselves come under a law from which the Jews had been delivered and which could not deliver them. The uh, Gentile was not a natural son, but came, uh, became a son uh, by adoption. Adam was created by God to be his son. Adam sinned and thereby rejected God as his father because of sin. And of course, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But because of sin, man is no longer uh, a natural son, but was made such by adoption based on trust and obedience. Baptism is the act of adoption by which uh, one passes from the family of the devil to the family of God as sons and a brother to Christ. One is born a natural child. One is baptized as an adopted child. In verse 6, it reads, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of the Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, and of course, uh, Abba is a Aramaic word for father, so we could almost read father, father, but Abba, father. <clears throat> because they are now sons by adoption, through baptism, of course, under the law of Christ and not servants under the old law, they could cry out, Abba, father. That's a personal relationship. As sons, God sent forth the spirit of the son into their hearts. Romans 8, uh, uh, verse 9 says in part, Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. It was also written in Romans 8, uh, chapter 8, verse 15, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. In verse 7, it reads, therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Under the Mosaic system, they were under bondage. As a result of the faith system of the gospel, they were no longer bond servants, but sons. And as sons were heirs of God, uh, all this was obtained, obtained through uh, faith in Christ who redeemed them, purchased them, and pardoned them. Christ is the son of the father, and Christians are his brothers. Matthew 12, uh, 12 chapter verse 50 and Hebrews 2 verse 11 following. You can read those at your leisure. So if that's the case, then we are sons of the Father as well. In verse 8, it says, But then, indeed, when you did not know God, you served those by which, by which by nature are not gods. Now, the Jews knew God, but the Gentiles did not. Since they did not, they worshiped all sorts of pagan idols, which, by the very nature of an idol, is not a God. Of course, over their history, the Jews were guilty of worshiping idols as well and received divine punishment as a result. 
in verse 9 it says but now after you have known god and uh in john chapter 17 verse 3 it says and this is eternal life that they may know you the only true god and, and jesus christ whom you have sent since you have known god or rather are known by god and again in first corinthians 8 chapter verse 3 but if anyone loves god this one is known by him. So if you're known by God, and you have to love him, how is it that you turn again in, uh, to the weak and beggarly elements? Again, this elements that we mentioned before. Now this turning again uh, is a Greek present tense. So they were in, apparently in the process of turning they may not have turned completely, but they were in the process of turning to the weak and beggarly elements to which uh, you desire. Of course, their actions gave such substance to their desire to which you desire, again, to be in bondage. Having come to a knowledge of the, the one true God and having been adopted by him, they received the spirit of the Son in their hearts. How could they? return to those elements that had held them in bondage. The Gentiles had been held in bondage to heathenism and not the mosaical system, but to embrace Judaism placed them in bondage all the same. In Galatians, the 10th uh, verse of chapter four, it says you observe days and months and season and years so Jew and Gentile alike kept feasts and observances. The mosaical system found its fulfillment in Christ and was uh, done away with, whereas heathenism or paganism was uh, never condoned. Given the blessings and promises of the gospel system, why go back to these former systems? Either one of them. This passage does not mean that the Jews kept all the feasts and observances because they didn't. But if any were impressed upon the Gentiles as necessary for salvation, then they may as well have been required, uh, have required the Gentiles to keep all of the law. Can't keep one part of it without keeping all of it. Verse 11 says, I'm afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. Uh, Paul taught them the gospel of Christ as revealed by the Holy Spirit. But they were embracing another gospel, which is not another gospel. Now, the, the consequences of doing such uh, were horrific uh, to contemplate. And I'm going to let you contemplate that over the next week since we're at the bottom of the hour. So next week, we will start at verse 12 of chapter 4 of Galatians. Thank you.